everyone. There are just one or two things happening here at the Church of the Palms. Are you ready? Today we will have another wonderful fellowship and coffee hour and take our last looks at the Straight from the Heart art show and sale. So you can purchase paintings, you can purchase greeting cards and other items of interest, but today's the last day, so enjoy that. Coming up this week, the team meetings and ministry opportunities are listed on page three of your worship guide. Our learning opportunities with Jim Yang Hellowell on Living the Question, John Durbin on Jumpstart, Beth Moore on Hope Still Lives for a Just Peace between Israel and Palestine, and Lynette Stenberg is Cosmic Christians all the way. Bobby Chapman is on Shared Conversations. All of those are listed in your order of worship. Thank you to our leaders of those important groups for your pre preparation and for your leadership. Dice Art Kids are still in need of socks and underwear for children. Linda Hoffman is leading out in that important effort. If you have questions, see her, which, by the way, there are four or five or six collection boxes out in the narthex for a variety of giving opportunities. Have a look to see how you might get involved. Then as we look to April, April the 6th at 3.30, we will be having our first in-person Church of the Palms information and orientation meeting. This is for those of you who would like to know a little bit more about the Church of the Palms and her ministries. It is also a time for you to get your questions answered on the ways that you could join the church or become involved in the ministries here. There's a light supper and a whole lot of fun. So make sure you sign up out in the narthex and uh, be a part of that opportunity. Saturday, April 9th is lunch with a bunch at Little Bite of Italy. There's a poster and a sign-up sheet on the tables in the narthex. Make sure you put your name down for that. April 10th, which is a Sunday, is our Sanctuary Choir and Musicians musical presentation for Palm Sunday. You're not going to want to miss this worship service. And then on Good Friday, we will have a service in the sanctuary beginning at noon. And then immediately following, there will be a guided labyrinth walk observing the stations of the cross. Finally, the flowers on the chancel today are in honor of Bonnie and Larry Wyman's 60th wedding anniversary. The flowers uh, on the table are in memory of Dan Kozlowski. And a service is pending in our memorial garden. As soon as we have those uh, bits of information, we'll be sure to let you know. That and all the other opportunities of worship and service are available for you. Come and be a part of the Church of the Palms. Pastor Paul. Good morning. I'm Pastor Paul. You've already met Pastor Jim. And together we greet you in the name of Jesus we don't always take ourselves seriously around here, but we do take caring for each other seriously. We are an open and firming congregation, and what that means is we extravagantly welcome everyone, part of people who are part of the LGBTQ community and those who are just tired of hate. This is a safe place for you to be you, I get to be me, and together we are a beautiful rainbow of love. Today we're looking at the familiar Luke 15, the lost sheep, coin, and child. I had a seminary professor say that if the entire Bible was lost except for the three parables in Luke 15, our faith would survive. That last parable about the prodigal reaches across time across the roles we play throughout our lives. Maybe, maybe you're like me. There are times in life in which I have played the role of the prodigal, having wasted much blessings and opportunities. At times, I've been grumbling and jealous of what others have. 
At times I have been the welcoming father. I have lived a life of the unmentioned mother having no say in what's happening. I've even played the role of the fatted calf which is slaughtered while others party. (laughs) No matter where you find yourself this day, wherever you are on your journey of life, know that God loves you and you are welcomed by God and you are welcomed here at the Church of the Palms. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. A lot of men and women of questionable reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled. Their grumbling triggered this story. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. 
Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? When found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing. And when you got home, call in your friends and neighbors saying, celebrate with me, I found my lost sheep. Please stand in body or spirit and join me in our opening hymn, Christians We Have Met to Worship. continues. Imagine a woman who has ten coins and loses one. And when she finds it, you can be sure she'll call her friends and neighbors. Celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Lamb of God, 
Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. You have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the whole. God, oh, wash me in his precious blood till I am just a lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood. A Lamb of God. In our spiritual reading section of worship, we present different quotes from a variety of people and perspectives. Some of the people you might be familiar with, others not so much, but all have wisdom for us. Today, we have Melody in F. It was originally conceived by Phil Kerr and tells the story of Luke 15, 11 through 32. Pastor Paul has added his edits as well. <laughs> Feeling footloose and frisky, a feather-brained fellow forced his fond father to fork over the farthings <laughs> and flew far to foreign fields and frittered his fortune, feasting fabulously with faithless friends. <laughs> Fleeced by his fellows in folly and facing famine, he found himself a feed flinger in a filthy farmyard. <laughs> Fairly famishing, he fain would have filled his frame with foraged food from fodder fragments. <laughs> Fooey, my father's flunkies fare far finer the frazzled fugitive forlornly fumbled, frankly facing facts. Frustrated by failure and filled with foreboding, he fled forthwith to his family. Falling at his father's feet, he forlornly fumbled, Father, I flunked and fruitlessly forfeited family favor. <laughs> the far-sighted father, forestalling further flinching, frantically flagged the flunkies to fetch a fatling from the flock and fix a feast. The fugitive's fault-finding brother frowned on fickle forgiveness of former falderall, but the faithful father figured, filial fidelity is fine, but the fugitive is found. What forbids fervent festivity? Let flags be unfurled, let fanfares flare, the father's forgiveness formed the foundation for the former fugitive's future fortitude. Fini. Thank you. 
this scripture. Um, Dave, that was uh, fantabulous. <laughs> Luke 15, 11 to 32. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the profit property that belongs to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens in that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up. I will go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quickly, bring a robe, the best one, and Put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. And they begin to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked, what was going on? He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he began 
to become angry and refuse to go in, his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you. I have never disobeyed your commandment, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come home. 
story. There was once a group of people left on an island for years and years and years. As time passed, they, they told a joke every day. And as you can imagine, they ran out of new jokes and had to retell the, the old ones that, well, everyone knew. So to simplify things, they gave the jokes numbers. And to tell the joke, they just simply called out a number instead of reciting the whole thing. Fifteen, and then there'd be laughter. Eleven, and then there'd be laughter. And then one guy says, twenty-three, and there's dead silence. He repeats, twenty-three, still silence. So he asks, how come you laughed at 15 and 11, but not 23? And everyone in unison said, because you just can't tell a joke. <laughs> as, as strange as that may sound, we do the same thing for many familiar Bible stories. So my homiletics professor, Dick White, said. He said, instead of giving them numbers... We give them names, but it works the same way. Just mention David and Goliath, or the Good Samaritan, and everyone who hears remembers the story and the lessons it teaches. We don't need to recite the whole thing. We don't need to read the whole thing from Scripture. We already know it. Today's lesson is one of those stories. All we need is the name, the prodigal son. We know the rest of the story. We can recite the story from memory. That's part of the reason I changed up the presentation a bit so that we just didn't hear what we expected to hear. Now we're wondering... Which of the familiar sermons we're going to hear? Well, an old-fashioned approach will call on sinners to come home from their debauchery. A more modern attempt will remind us that we're all sometimes like the prodigal. We've all wasted God's blessings. We've heard those sermons before, and we could recite them ourselves. So does the Word of God have nothing more to say than just what we expect, what we already know. Hmm. Or is it enough to call out the number? Let the listener remember and recite the joke, the story to themselves. Well, it depends on what we expect. If we already assume, we, we already know the story and its meaning, if we expect our faith to simply be affirmed, that's what we're going to hear. But if we expect more, more than the usual, familiar, traditional, there is more to be heard in this story. But to expect more means to search for it, to read, to listen to Scripture, and not just rehearse the cliff note version in our memory. So I ask... Can we do that? Can we turn off our memory banks, which tell us, oh, we already know that story and its meaning? Can we look and listen carefully for what this story is saying to us? With that, will you please pray with me? 
May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So the story of the prodigal is preceded by two others told on the same occasion. The three make up the whole 15th chapter of Luke. First, there's a shepherd. Leaves 99 sheep to seek the one who strayed. It's called the lost sheep. Second, a woman lost some money. Searched the whole house. It's named the lost coin. The last is about a, a kid who strayed, but a parent who can't bring the kid back because people got to live their own lives. But also a parent who is longing for that return. Sometimes it's been called the prodigal or lost son. It's repeated three times. There it is. The chapter is about the lost. Now that's the obvious lesson. Is there anything else? Well, the shepherd called friends and said, celebrate. The woman called neighbors and said, rejoice. The father said, hey, it's party time. Now, now, since that's repeated three times, we can also say that this chapter is about rejoicing when the lost is found. Why haven't we, we named the stories the sheep that was found, the coin that was found, the child who returned? Lost? Yes. But also found. Which is more important? What else is there? Well, Jesus ended each story with an editorial comment. After the first, he said, there's more joy over one who repents than over 99 who don't need to. The second, he says, there's more joy among the angels when one sinner repents. And in the third, the father insists that it is right to celebrate the son's return. It seems that Jesus is saying the moral in each story is rejoicing over the return of the lost. So why'd he do that? One itty bitty little tiny detail we sometimes forget tells us. It's because someone questioned the loss being found. Someone questioned the loss being found. Someone questioned the lost being found. Now who, who would do that? Who wouldn't want the lost found? The one who has the most to be gained by the lost staying lost. The elder brother in the last story. He's the reason for Jesus telling these three stories. It's all leading up to his reaction. So how do we know that? Well... If we're going to go back, we've got to go back to the original audience. Back to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15. It says, The scribes and Pharisees complained because Jesus hung out with the lost. Sinners, tax collectors, irreligious people, those no goods who were extravagantly welcomed by him and gathering around him. The passage says, The Pharisees complained. So Jesus decided to tell them, and the crowd, these stories. So when the last story ends with the elder brother complaining, the Pharisees would have known Jesus was talking about them, pointing out their hardness of heart in front of everyone. And boy, oh boy, did it make them mad. Now, none of us like our sins pointed out publicly. Neither did the Pharisees. Our lesson wasn't originally addressed to the lost, calling them to, to repent, come home. Although that's a good lesson we can take from it. Nor was it originally addressed to, to the disciples, sending them out to seek the lost. Again, a good lesson, but not the original. Originally, it was how to behave when God sends extravagant welcome 
to the unworthy, unfit, undeserving, improper, with whom the Pharisees don't associate because those folks don't follow the rules. That is, keep the fast. Maintain a kosher kitchen. Tithe their produce. Keep the whole law. They were mad that Jesus was welcoming the vulnerable and those who don't fit in. So if we're going to hear more from this lesson, we're going to have to go old school. Preserve its original meaning to the original audience. That is, we see these, these stories address us. Yeah, you and me as Pharisees who grumble and complain when Jesus offers love and grace to those we know are unfit and undeserving. Those who don't have the proper church background. Those who don't say the right words in Jesus' name. Those who don't dress correctly. Those who don't practice the faith as we do. We're the elder brothers and sisters who tearfully insist, God, I come to church every Sunday, but this other child of yours, they're doing it all wrong. I'm the one coming to church. I'm the one doing all the work. Throw a party for me. Now, before I go any further, I do need to say that the Pharisees did make a good point. Because Jesus clearly hung out with people who didn't fit in the box of faith that that society had created. Jesus hung out with the, the, those people he hung out with were, were folks with whom the proper religious community was outraged because of their presence. But, but let's be honest. So would you and I be outraged? We would be. We are. We're like those Pharisees. We're the defenders of Scripture and students of faith. We're committed, hard-working members of the faith community... So there is a temptation for us to feel superior than others. So like our pharisaical kinfolk, we're troubled when God extends a welcome to those who, well, don't follow the rules properly, don't practice the faith correctly as we do. So what is it? What is it that you and I grumble and complain about? I could make a list that went on and on and on and on. Is it, oh, how about, oh, what about? What is it that you and I grumble and complain about and say, you know, I, I don't like Jesus with those people. We could continue on and on and on, complaining about other improper, unworthy, disgraceful, wasteful persons and actions that embarrass us, that upset us and our faith. This text clearly sees you and me, all of us, as elder brothers and sisters, names the party we won't join, whose fatted calf we won't eat, because we're Pharisees. We're clearly superior to them in keeping the law and practicing the faith. Now, of course, we're not expected to join all those parties. The text doesn't mean our way is wrong, their way is right. What is said to them, and what this text says to us today is, when God throws a party, don't be so sure that God has to do it in our place, playing our music, the music we like, the serving the food we like, playing the games we're good at. As much as anything, this text is telling us that it really isn't up to us to judge how others labor. Don't. Judge. I think that's the central message of this tick, text. Don't judge. And boy, oh boy, do we need to hear that. Because if we're honest, really honest, we got to admit, we judge folks. And finally, thank God there's one more word for us in this text. The good news if I've done my job, I'm stepping on some toes like Jesus did on those ancient Pharisees. But the good news, my friends, ends this trilogy of stories. And although it's brief, it's a glorious and welcome word. 
Notice that the father, like the shepherd and the woman in the previous stories, is representing God. Shepherd, woman, father represent God. Notice that God didn't stay in the barn, sitting on the couch, or remaining in the villa, but went out to the field and earnestly urged the grumbling elder brother. God went to the one grumbling. And the one who grumbled wasn't severely rebuked for callous resentment. That means in telling the story, Jesus was entreating the Pharisees and the scribes, not denouncing them. And when we hear it, Jesus is urging us, although we're upset by brothers and sisters, we aren't cast off, denounced as unworthy, banished from God's favor or welcome. Far from that. In this story, the father went to the elder brother and said, you are always welcome with me. And all that I love and have is yours. We are all in God's sight. We are all in God's favor. We are all welcomed by God, no matter what part we play in the story, no matter where we find ourselves on our journeys. God says to you and me, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. Thanks be to God. Amen. We've come to our time of, of prayer, and uh, we want to lift up the Ukrainian and Russian war and the people involved when we pray for peace. We want to lift up uh, Jeffrey Scruggs. He's having surgery this week. We pray for Jim and Jeff. We pray for healing and the courage to face the future unafraid. My friends, we may not claim the grand, obvious sins of the prodigal, but like the elder brother, we all have made transgressions that quelled the flow of God, God's love through us. Lent's a good time to examine ourselves. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, mover of earth and anchor of our souls, you never give up on us. Again and again, we refuse to listen to your voice. We close the door on opportunities you open. We ignore and deny you. We, 
refuse the shelter of your strength. And yet you affirm us and persist in giving us good gifts. Your love is not tame, O God. Your love surges wave upon wave of grace and mercy breaking upon us. You knock at the door of our consciousness. You search out the lost coin, sheep, person, yet out in the cold. You urge us to be persistent and bold in prayer. Time after time you bring miracle, wonder, and healing. If we have resisted your love in any way, holy God, open us to your power. Help us to forgive, to feel joy, to live again. Let Christ be born in our hearts and turn us back to you during this season of Lent. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, praying, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. When there is a particularly moving piece of music for me, you might hear me sing along with the person silently. Well, maybe not always silently in my head, but <laughs> sing along. And then there are times when I close my eyes. There are twi- and just an- enjoy the beauty of the moment. There have been twice this morning that I've done that. First, it was Jennifer's prelude. And then it was Pastor Jim's song. We've experienced beauty today. Now God is calling us to open our eyes, go out there, and be the church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Oh. Uh-huh.